Uh, it's it's uh, simultaneously a huge honor and honestly spectacularly terrifying to be asked to speak alongside these men and women. I mean, every one of them has more insight in their little pinky than I've got in my entire body. And, uh, you know, I really just want to start out by saying, uh, you know, this is 2020. This is a new decade. It's our decade. It's our 20s. That's kind of crazy. And uh, it's the vision of, or it's the decade of perfect vision, the year of perfect vision, not clear or focused vision, perfect. And that word carries a little bit of weight. How do we even hope to approach that standard? And so, you know, the answer is actually fairly simple. And it's hindsight. For those of you in the audience without foresight, hindsight also happens to be 2020. And I apologize for that joke. But <laughs> I had to fit the theme so well. Uh, what I'm going to do is a little bit different. I'm going to give you all a, uh, a rapid fire barrage of some of the most thought provoking development design ideas that I've come across in my you know, fairly short career so far. Think of this as like a lightning round. It's basically just meant to spur some ideas and some imagination for you guys as we move forward into this next decade. And so, uh, really, the last thing I want to say before I start that is that you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, giants that step into the arena day after day, full of ideas, full of resolve, and often they fail spectacularly. We all fail spectacularly. Hindsight's a gift that they give to us. It comes to them at dear cost, but it's given to us freely. And so, it's okay to play armchair quarterback, and it's okay to make fun after the game. It's actually kind of fun to do that. But... Uh, you can only do that if you're willing to step into the arena yourself the next week and bloody your own damn nose out there on the field. And so that's my challenge to y'all in 2020 is to you know, learn from these giants that I'm about to introduce you to and the ones that you've heard from today and Rudy, who you're going to hear, <laughs> hear from after me and uh, take those lessons to heart and move forward in the right direction for 2020. So the first idea is number one, uh, the transect, Ian McCard. So... The transect uh, is a pretty simple, pretty simple concept, but it's very profound. Imagine yourself in Surfside, Texas. It's a warm, sunny day. You're walking up through the surf, past the minnows, over the beach, past all the fiddler crabs. You go over the crossover, and you pass the dune. It makes a fantastic windbreak for your beach house barbecue pit. Once you get past the rows of beach houses, you get through the salt grass and the mud flats, and you drop into Drum Bay with the speckled trout and the redfish and the friggin' hardheads, right? That's a transect. Multiple unique zones with absolutely unique flora, fauna, uh, mineral profiles, soil profiles, things of that nature. Uh, and ecologists have been using the concept of the transect for over 200 years to describe the relationships between all those different organisms and, and uh, microclimates and things of that nature. Scottish landscape architect Ian McHarg was the first that really pushed us as designers and developers to take hold of that concept and apply it to the built world. And so for the first time, ecologists, environmentalists, and builders were able to speak with the same language. It's a monumental achievement. I'm going to play off it. Sorry, that's just a really pretty picture. I'm not going to use it. But <laughs> uh, I'm going to play off the transect a couple more times here. The urban to rural transect, or excuse me, the rural to urban transect, uh, really uh, is kind of the first, the first permutation of the transect that I've taken to heart. The new urbanist, Andreas Duani, Elizabeth Platter, Platter Zyberg, Brian Falk, they really took Ian McCarg up on his challenge. They began to apply the transect to the built environment. And so what we get are these zones, you usually see it from T1 to T6, T7 special districts, but they describe the relative ruralism or urbanity of a place. And so they allow us to identify appropriate development intensities, and then within those intensities, we can assign design details that evoke those rural or urban characteristics. And so, again, a very elegant tool. It basically allows us to balance the natural world with the man-made world, which, as Jonathan, Jonathan said earlier, it's something that's become increasingly important as we move forward. The next permutation of the transect is the vernacular classical transect. I'm going to give Steve Muzan of Muzan Design uh, credit here. He's really the one that's reminded us that, you know, as you move in from the country to the urban core, buildings tend to move from a more relaxed vernacular form or folk forms to a more refined classical form, like what you'd see from Vitru Vitruvius or something like that. Uh, and so, you know, just like people, buildings get dressed up when they go to town, right? It took me a while to figure out where 12 Monkeys Brad Pitt design, you know, belonged in this spectrum. 
But, uh, <laughs> you know, jokes aside, it's important. It's a very important design concept because what it allows us to do is add authenticity to our projects. Uh, as you think about the spectrum of the transect from the urban core to the country, you can assign these folk or relaxed forms like your, your 1920s bungalows or whatever. And then also you can think about uh, civic architecture like your churches. You know, this concept that buildings get dressed up when they go to town, that's as true of one horse towns as it is of metropolises. Uh, you know, the former may just have that one church with the nice columns or whatever, but they're there. So start looking for them. Idea number four, and this is my last transect, I promise, the private public transect. A ton of us have fallen in love with uh, Ross Chapin's book on pocket neighborhoods. Uh, these are basically, it's a classical development form. You used to see it. John Nolan designed these back prior to World War II. But they're clusters of homes or apartments that share, that surround a common space, a common green. And they're fantastic at doing one thing, providing a sense of community, creating a sense of community. You can see that right there. I mean, who wouldn't want to sit out there and have a cup of coffee on that porch, watch the kids play? The problem with them is that your neighbors basically end up right on top of each other, right? There's very small side setbacks and things of that nature. And so Chapin and the designers of old that were doing these had a very particular problem that's really instructive or should be instructive to us. And that's how do you balance a sense of community with a sense of privacy? And so if you can imagine our final transect today pulled from the center of that common green up to your living room, You've got a space in that green that's 100% public space. It's meant to be littered with kids' toys and spur debate over pet waste, right? But as you get across the sidewalk, you start incurring, uh, encountering excuse me, these different layers of boundaries that lend your project you know, additional levels of privacy without stamping out that sense of community. So you see you've got a three-foot fence. You've got the shrubbery, you may have some dwarf trees, you've got an elevated crow's nest position with the porch, rails, balusters, the furniture, the front door, and eventually a shower curtain, right? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> nobody's ever seen Psycho here, huh? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> although, you know, justifiably, we may want to put 50 foot setbacks or walls or even prison bars between us and our neighbors. There are other ways to accomplish uh, earning a level of privacy or building a level of pri privacy into our projects without doing so. So we need to start thinking about that as we move forward. Idea number five, no-go, slow-go, and go-go. It's a really, uh, it's a simple concept, but again, another, these are all fairly profound, obviously. Uh, so this one's an Aggies concept. This is Dr. Chris Mulder, who got his landscape architecture doctorate here, began it in 1978. He went back to South Africa. He was a former farmer and established, you know, a world-class design and development firm. It's fantastic work. What you see there is the master plan for the Crossways Farm Village. And so... What this, uh, what this idea means, basically, is that you know, once we've figured out how to design a project, we have to figure out where to build it. And Chris does this by using a technique that he calls sieve analysis. And he takes a master plan like that and begins to overlay all the critical information, hydro hydrology, you know, geotechnical information, soil profiles, uh, vegetation, etc. And in so doing, he identifies three different types of land. No-go land is left to be preserved. It's, uh, think of it as your old growth forests or your wetlands and riparian areas, maybe historic sites. That's land that does not need to be touched. And what it offers your project is enduring value because that is an irreplaceable amenity that cannot be, cannot be uh, replicated by any of your competition. The second category, slow go, might be your prime farmland or critical view sheds, and that should be held as a development reserve. Uh, if you need to develop it, if it's you know, absolutely vital to the success of the project, okay, maybe you can tap into it. But really, it should be put to a more low intensity use, and in this project, that would be agriculture. And then finally, once you're done harvesting your pearls, then you can start looking at where are the, where are the places that really are begging for human habitation. And those are what we call go-go areas, right? And they can be built to whatever intensity the context demands. Dr. Mulder's you know, particular genius is that he's able to harvest sufficient premiums on the land values on that third category of land in order to preserve the other two. And you can see that in the skeleton of his land plan there. 
So if we're, again, talking about the flooding in Houston or if we're talking about just general climate change concerns, this is a great way to start looking at how we can conserve our land. He's really doing it through a mix of uses and a mix of housing types, which grants his projects natural affordability. I'm going to skip past six and seven because it'll take me an hour to get through them. You're welcome. <laughs> Idea number eight, I timed myself last night, so. <laughs> Idea number eight is the pedestrian shed. We've got the new urbanists uh, back here. I, again, we've got Andres Duani, Elizabeth Blatter Zyberg, et cetera. Uh, this is another concept that, uh, that we see everywhere. I mean, Midway, you know, is another, I keep using them as an example, but Century, or City Center, excuse me, and Century Square wouldn't exist without this concept. Um, Think of neighborhoods as the basic building blocks, the smallest divisible component of a city where you've got all the fundamental components. You can strip a neighborhood apart into blocks or corridors, uh, buildings, but if you do that, you lose some of the essential uses, the retail, the office space, the industrial, the pocket parks, things of that nature. You don't really have anything left. So it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like an atom. You can isolate the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons, but you've got no chemical element at the end of the day. So if we see that neighborhood, or excuse me, cities are basically just tapestries of neighborhoods that are, that are sewn together with corridors, uh, then it's pretty easy to argue from that that every neighborhood should be self-sustaining. We should be able to get all of our basic goods and services that we need in a given week to survive within our neighborhood. Why not? I mean, if the component DNA is flawed, then you can bet that the hole is in trouble, right? And so, you know, the next thing that I would say is that from there, you know, as a culture, we honor our elders, we cherish our children, and we defend the defenseless. And so it's pretty easy for me to argue from that point that our neighborhoods, not only should they, you know, self-sustain, but they should be universally accessible to the young, to the elderly, and the handicapped. And so we're kind of left when we begin our land planning with a problem, or with two options, really. The first option is to punish our grandparents who can't drive for their failing eyesight and make them walk you know, 20 minutes to go get their milk and eggs, which, you know, the average healthy human or healthy adult takes about 20 minutes to make that happen, right? <laughs> That's one option. Uh, the second option, <laughs> the second option is to start your land planning by taking your map and drawing circles, circles that have a quarter mile radius, and all those essential goods and services are placed as close to the center of that circle as possible. That way you've got an average five minute walk to get all your basic goods and services. That should be the first thing that you do on your site plan before you start going. You know, unless you hate the elderly. It's up to you. <laughs> I figured you'd like that one. Yeah. All right, number nine, light imprint. I'll go a little faster on this one. Uh, so now that we've designed our site, we figured out how to design and we've figured out where it goes, we can start doing some value engineering. Light imprint is a, and that's really hard to see, I apologize, but you can see the lines there, which is your stormwater pipe. That's what you really need to see. Uh, light imprint is just a civil engineering methodology, and basically it's a way that we can utilize natural drainage and infiltration techniques, natural channeling, alongside more conventional pipe and pond infrastructure, and basically create projects that lie lighter on the land. So they're, uh, they're less infrastructure intensive and uh, hopefully a little bit cheaper. Tom Lowe is the giant that I'm giving credit for for this idea. He, he wrote a book called The Light Imprint Handbook where he categorized a bunch of these techniques like bioretention swales and rain gardens and things like that, uh, pervious paving. He categorized them along that urban rural transect and then he began implementing them. This project that you can barely see up here is uh, Griffin Park in Greensboro, South Carolina. And uh, what they did with this project was they basically went through full conventional engineering up to the point that they got their opinions of probable cost. And once they figured out what that was going to cost, they started value engineering and they applied a light imprint overlay. They went back to a traditional street classification, which led them to cut two feet off of the widths of all their pavement sections. They went to their service alleys that had lighter traffic. They took out the asphalt and they put in crushed stone, which is pervious instead of the impervious layer. Along all the local streets, they took out as much conventional piping and curb inlets as they could, and in place of that, they put bioretention swales, which are really a natural amenity. They're gorgeous. Uh, and then in place of the monolithic detention ponds, which we all know and love, uh, they got rid of that and built a number where you can barely see some of the green that's up there, but a number of rain gardens and filtration basins throughout the project. 
at the end of the day, they were able to cut their finished lot costs by 31% by making those changes. You can't do it everywhere. And I can tell you from my experience in San Antonio, most of your engineers are going to look at you like you're insane if you try and get them to do it. But if you push hard enough, you can get two or three of these strategies into your projects and save some money while doing some good. Ideas 10 and 11, uh, living traditions in the original green. Steve Muzan's back on here. You can tell he's a hero of mine. Uh, before we had Energy Star air conditioning systems and before we had building envelopes that were tight enough that we could probably send them to the moon, we had, you know, we had to grapple with Mother Nature using more uh, tried and true common sense building methods that uh, really have been passed down from generation to generation. You know, Steve calls the collection of those the original green, and each one of them is a living tradition. And, uh, you know, you know most of these intuitively. You can see on this house, uh, kind of, sort of, uh, this deep front porch. You know, a deep front porch on a sunny southern exposure helps us eliminate some of the solar gain inside the home, right? And uh, we open windows on opposite walls, and we open clear story windows near the, near the ceiling to pull cross and chimney ventilation in our projects. We paint our shutters pink in the Bahamas, like you can see here, because that's what we do in the Bahamas, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's what they do. Someone's going to have to explain that to me. But, uh, but that's a living tradition. And what's interesting about that is I can tell that this kind of low country style home is in the Bahamas and not in the southeastern United States because all good Georgians and South Carolinians know that we paint our porch ceilings light blue. Anybody ever seen that before? See it all over the place. You've, there's one, there's a project in Bryan actually downtown that's got that as well. And, uh, you know, that, uh, why do we do that? Well, I think common wisdom is that it discourages spider webs, cobwebs, insects, you know, they mistake it for the sky or whatever it is, right? But really, you know, as you do your research on that, what you find out is that that blue is actually meant to, uh, to scare away haints and boo hags. Yeah, gullahs, the gullahs of the low country <laughs> use that blue because haints and boo hags, as we all know, are fear, have a fear for water. So if you don't believe me, go walk around uh, the older parts of Atlanta the Chattahoochee foothills and see how much blue window trim and blue ceilings you find. Those are living traditions. I didn't say they were all pragmatic, uh, but the ones that are pragmatic really do help us, uh, you know, help us conserve electricity. They're common sense solutions to problems that are not just modern problems, they're universal problems. And what they can do for us today is they can take some of the effort off of Alexa's climate control system, right? If we do things right in the first place. Idea number 12 up here, it's really 10 for you guys, is the, uh, is the new ruralism. So, uh, you know, this returns us to Dr. Chris Mulder, uh, who's been obviously a mentor of mine. This is, this is the project that I'm going to go work on here once I, once I leave. But um, the new ruralism obviously takes a cue from the new urbanists, the new urbanism. What Dr. Mulder and his team have done so far in the first two phases of this project are take classical agrarian forms, the hub and spoke pattern of the villages and the hamlets that most agricultural societies were based on. And they've applied modern technology, modern engineering, and modern sensibilities to the project. And so, you know, for years and years, we have sought after this idea of the American pastoral. I mean, from Ebenezer Howard in the Garden Cities to the hippie communes of the 70s, right? We all want to get back to the land. Most of us get out on our kayaks or something like that or go hike a trail on the weekends. It's something that we yearn for. And so what's really unique about this project, many, you know, many, many developers have instituted pocket parks or community gardens and things like that, and those are all great. What's interesting about this project, what sets it apart, is that it is a true agrarian community. Uh, you've got multiple hubs of primarily residential spaces, but every one of those residents, including the local visitors and the local township of Thornhill, have got access to small-scale agriculture like hobby gardening, uh, totally self-sufficient farming for your family. There's even an industrial dairy operation that's going on there. And this community, using that go-go, slow-go, no-go, uh, excuse me, criteria that we talked about earlier, uh, it's laid out to maximize that land. So they're marching forward towards this idea of a modern agrarian society. Not that it's for everybody, but it is kind of the more underserved era of the, or area of the rural to urban transect. And so I hope you guys will all come and check it out once it's all done. The last thing I'm going to say, uh, 
is just, I just want to leave you all with this quote from Buckminster Fuller. This guy, you know, this is man is a genius, obviously. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with him and don't even know it. I first encountered him when I was looking for, you know, Mickey Mouse with my parents when I was three. And, uh, you know, the geodesic dome, Spaceship Earth and Epcot. Right? That's, that was uh, Buckminster Fuller. This quote in particular, and maybe it's because I just tend to be a free marketeer, but this quote in particular has always meant something specific to me when it comes to land development. And that is that, you know, we can't, we can't force people to build the world in our image or in the image that we want to see it in. All we can do is try and lead by example and try and build the world as we see it and hope that others are compelled to follow. And so that's your challenge uh, as you guys step into the arena in 2020 and beyond. You know, plant your feet, square your hips, put up your fists, and give it hell. Thank you.